My guest today is Wendy Carling. Wendy is a professor of economics at the University College London, a fellow at the Centre for Economic Policy Research, and an expert advisor to the UK Treasury. She is also one of the founders of CORE, an organisation that promotes a new approach to teaching economics. Thanks very much for, for, for being here, uh, Wendy. I, I wanted to start by the, 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 the whole point of this, of this uh, podcast is to think about how things are going to change, how capitalism is going to change. And I wanted to, to start from, the, from, from World War II. Uh, World War II, uh, you've written, radically, drastically changed the narrative of capitalism. And economic narratives have changed in the past, potentially could change again. Could you, could you explain us how those narrative changes have happened in the past and why you think we might be about to, to produce one? Yeah, so um, th there really are precedents for, for a major change in the way people talk about the econ how the economy works. And that, that's what we mean by, by a narrative and how they relate uh, the, the economy to their everyday life. Um, they're, they're thinking about the future and so on. And so if you think about the, the disaster of the Great Depression um, and then how Roosevelt uh, talked about it, where he, where he said things like, heedless self-interest is bad economics. And he said, freedom from want was one of the four goals shaping policy. So he was um, seeding a narrative, if you like, where he was connecting uh, the way people behave to economics, to bad economics. And he was also introducing values, so freedom from want, and talking about the, the, the shape of shaping of, uh, of economic policy. And the, 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 the broader, broader kind of uh, uh, term you've used to, to refer to this kind of broad change in the way we, we think about the economy is the is paradigm. And many yeah. people throw around the word paradigm yeah. and, and it's not very clear often what they, what they mean. What's a paradigm change? What's a paradigm today? What, what would be a paradigm change? Yeah, okay. So I think it is really important to, to try and put some flesh on the bones of this, this word that's tossed around all the time. And so the kind of names people give are things like um, a Keynesian paradigm, Keynesian social democratic paradigm, um, or a paradigm of classical liberalism, or more recently, a neoliberal paradigm. And I think uh, a really helpful way of, of going from words to something concrete is to think of this in, in terms of four levels. And it kind of relates exactly to the Roosevelt uh, story. So a paradigm uh, has to rest on, at the bottom, on normative foundations, on some values. And then there, on top of that, there has to be some economic theory, economic model, and the two have to work together, the, uh, the, the economic model interacting and reinforcing the, the values. And then um, on, on top of that is the policies, right? That's, the, that's how the values are brought into the world with the help of uh, economic theory. And then there's the narrative, right? How, 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 how is it explained? How is it talked about? How do people come to understand it and, and connect it to their life? So that's the sort of, I think, this four level structure of a mm -hmm. paradigm. Um, and it's probably good to, take one, take yes. another one, like not, not just stick to the, the, the post-World War II one, but think of the earlier one, think of um, classical liberalism. And so the values there, so starting at the bottom level, um, the values there center on, on uh, things like equal dignity. So it was sort of anti-paternalistic li liberty and breaking away from the narrow parochialism and social hierarchies that had preceded um, uh, that, uh, that paradigm. The economic model is the, the one that we, um, we always learn very well, the kind of Smith-Mill uh, model of uh, comparative advantage, division of labor, mm -hmm. um, specialization, and then we can immediately see, okay, what are the emblematic policies of the, of the classical liberal paradigm? Well, they're the policies of free trade, breaking up monopolies, repeal of the corn laws. And then how do we talk about it? Well, you can think of it um, out of the mouth of um, uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice, who, who, who said to the queen, 
uh, is all done by everyone minding their own business. So, so you can move all the way from those sort of underlying values to the, to the vernacular or, or the everyday language. So that's a way of thinking about what paradigms are. If you were to talk about the in-between paradigm, it would be the Keynesian paradigm. How yep. would those four levels yep. so, be? Different? So think about, you know, what, what are the normative foundations of the, of the Keynesian paradigm? So there we're thinking about values of security and shared prosperity. And those then come together with the economic model, the model that says you don't necessarily have full employment all by itself. It has to, uh, there's, a, there's a role for an active government. So that obviously matches up with the, the Roosevelt uh, story earlier on. The policy framework we know very well, but you couldn't have had the policy framework without the new theory of Keynes, the new model, with its new concept of aggregate demand. And then the way it was talked about was uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, 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 the, the, the need to, for, for government to sustain aggregate demand in times of uh, deep recession. And we've seen, we've seen that very uh, activity uh, in spades all around the world in the last uh, months. And that's interesting, right? Because the Keynesian, uh, uh, the Keynesian paradigm was displaced when we had the, the great stagflation and in came the neoliberal paradigm. But the, the, the sort of battle that's been taking place in the context of COVID has really pushed the dial uh, back towards, if you like. So is it A, B, A, B? Is, is it A, B, A, B, the neoliberal paradigm, you would just say is basically at these four levels, very much like the Smithian classical one, or, or was there substantial differences there? Uh, in the neoliberal one, yes, I think there's a very big difference from, it's not, uh, yes, it's not A, B, A, B. <laughs> uh, um, so if you think of the, uh, so what are the values underlying the neoliberal paradigm? And that's really a commitment to freedom from interference by the state. Um, that's complementary to an economic model, uh, uh, different from the, um, the classical liberal one. It's, it's really uh, centred on, price-taking markets where everything relevant for economic interactions is covered by a contract and where people and government officials are self-interested. So there's a, there's a, a, a change across those three uh, paradigms. And the kind of emblematic policies of the neoliberal paradigm are things like uh, school vouchers, for instance, or negative income tax. And, and the, the language is uh, something like a government, the government's best governs least. So that's, uh, the, that's the kind of neoliberal story. And you can see why that's um, m much in, in debate now, given mm -hmm. the, the massive, uh, massively increased role of the state in the context of the pandemic. Shareholder value as well could be one of the key ways that this narrative is the, the higher level, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all about maximizing shareholder value yeah. and all the rest is kind of... That would be an example. That would be another example. And then we have kind of back, but you say not quite exactly back, but there is a chance that with the financial crisis and with the COVID uh, and with the observation that, that the state is necessary to sustain... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think there have heard any economist in the world say that we should just let the market run its course and everything collapse right now. You would no. say uh, we are seeing a chance or a certainty? I mean, would you see that we're going back to something pretty near to the, to the Keynesian paradigm? You've talked about not quite just the opposition between state and market, but something that needs uh, more elements. Is that, is that what, what's new now? Yeah, I think that's what's new. Although in, in the discussion, a lot of it has been along this axis. So, um, I mean, I think there's a, there's a nice quote from The Economist that, where they said, big government is needed to fight the pandemic, just exactly the words out, out, of, out of your mouth. But what matters is how it shrinks back again afterwards. A mm -hmm. pandemic government is not fit for everyday life. Mm -hmm. But then a really interesting um, thing is to, is to see what the Financial Times editorial board said, 
because mm -hmm. they were kind of uh, giving a different twist. They were saying radical reforms, reversing the prevailing policy direction of the last four decades, will need to be put on the table. Governments will need to take a more active role in the economy and, and policies considered eccentric, such as basic income and wealth taxes, will have to be in the mix. So even among those two kind of organs of the um, of elite, economics elite. establishment, yes. uh, there's, a, there's a, a different sense of this balance between market and state. But, but what, 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 um, I was, um, what you were kind of hinting at was that this kind of one, uh, one dimensional continuum of just kind of being pushed from, from a poll with markets to a poll with the government and then back again, um, but that's, that's enough to characterize paradigms. And, and that, uh, that's where I think it's not. And that um, both thinking about the pandemic, but also thinking about the other looming um, crisis of climate, really pushes to open up a, a richer space where we can insert a, a third pole. So that's, that's the argument. I would so make. this idea of community, <clears throat> um, you know, most people who've been, who've been, uh, who've been in this show, for example, they won't be surprised to think uh, that Ron Asimoglu, for example, think that basically, largely, what we are seeing when we, when we look at heterogeneity in the reactions by, by different states to the pandemic, is we're just seeing uh, different state capabilities, different abilities of the state to react. And that we don't necessarily need to look at societies and communities. Raghur Rajan, for example, uh, would disagree with, with this that pillar view. Why do you think we really, when you look at the different countries, why do you see communities as opposed to, well, you know, the same UK with the same community? Many people would think if, if the government had acted quicker and had actually been staffed maybe better, would have actually taken better decisions. So what is this community, is that part of the triangle really needed to understand what's yeah, going on? Yeah, okay, that, that's the question. And actually there's an interesting argument that's just come up in the last few days that maybe, maybe Britain had too many very good scientists <laughs> that, and that countries that, that did not have uh, a, a very well de developed scientific capability simply took the advice of the WHO and got on with it. And mm -hmm. so Greece is, is given uh, as an example. But that's a, that's a debate for another day. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think um, the, the argument has got to be that, that, that it's, so think of just, just needing two, right? Just needing the poll with government at one side and market on the other. And, some, and uh, then the claim really is that some, a combination of compliance with government authority, and we can make it as capable as you like, and uh, with market incentives, very well designed, that that's adequate to deal with a problem like a global pandemic or climate change. So to, to suggest that that's not the case, in other words, you know, granting all of the argument in favor of competence and excellent design uh, for market mechanisms, then why is it that we need this third poll, which I, um, in the work I've done, all of this work is joint work with Sam Bowles, mm -hmm. and we, we tend to prefer the term civil society rather than community, although pe people use both. And maybe just to give a little bit of, um, of uh, padding to that and, and yes, to try and explain what, what, what's meant. So the argument is that uh, we have to invoke other motives for human actions other than just compliance with state uh, authority and material incentives. So there are other motives for action. And those are motives like reciprocity, altruism, fairness, sustainability, also identity. And those motivations lie at this third pole. And they're implemented, uh, so actions around uh, the, the third pole are implemented through social norms and through the exercise of private power, so power within a firm, for example. Those things are simply excluded 
from the market government discussion. And I think it's, it's not difficult to see that when we, when we do look across countries and, um, and, look, and even within a country over time, that if we're going to understand how things have been handled and the outcomes of um, actions during the pandemic, we need to draw on these other motivations. So just take the example of um, that there's all this very rich data, cross-state data in the US on the timing of the reduction in economic activity relative to when the, uh, the official lockdown by the government, the state government in that, in that case, was, um, was announced. And, and the, the reduction in activity happened in every state well before the law. So people were taking actions based on these other motivations uh, without being told that they had to or that they were following the instructions of, of the government. So there's, there's a, um, and, and, and we can think of other, um, other examples of, of that kind. Mm -hmm. the, but um, uh, but just, just to step outside um, COVID for a second and just mm -hmm. think of the, of the triangle, just to give people yes. maybe a better idea. If you just think of um, uh, what kinds of things lie in different parts of the triangle. So the triangle is, is kind of a, a space in which you're using or you're placing policies or institutions that are combinations of uh, market, government, and civil society. So you can think of something down, if you, if you uh, look, at the, look at the triangle, you can see down towards the, the bottom and the left, there, there's a uh, kidney exchange. So mm -hmm. if you think of, think of how do you organize a kidney exchange? Well, for moral reasons, you probably don't want to buy and sell. Um, it's, it's, you can't compel. So you're relying on motiv motivations of altruism where someone who cares about a loved one who needs a kidney is prepared to give one of their kidneys to a stranger. So that's how a kidney exchange works. So it's a motivation that's based on caring about for others and a willingness to make a contribution to uh, a, a stock um, of, of of kidneys available for transplant. So that's the, the kind of, um, of motivations that, uh, and, and uh, act, uh, policies that where you need this space. So if we go back to, to COVID, then think about the, the really um, emblematic policies of the COVID. We've definitely got the ones at the government poll. So the government as insurer of last resort has stepped up to the mark, mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as we've already talked about. But then we've got things like uh, the enormous amounts of volunteering that mm -hmm. we've seen across societies occurring in, in very different ways with often sort of national specificities. Uh, but the one, the one in the UK was, a, was very notable. The NHS called for 250,000 volunteers. They had to say stop after five days because 750,000 people had volunteered. Um, so, so things, uh, activities have occurred because uh, people are willing to make a contribution. They're willing to follow social norms. They're willing to take on risks, as we've seen across. Um, uh, a kind of wide swathe of um, of the of the front line, but also of the of the essential services that uh, were not certainly not uh, rewarded in the market as essential. Absolutely. So, now, so think of the delivery drivers or the you know the, the the meat the meat packers and so on. You've 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 also pointed mm -hmm. out. I mean, you make it now sound very fuzzy, but as you have also been, and warm and nice, but as you've also right. pointed out community does have, and civil society does have these, these, all these motivations have also a dark side uh, in terms of the ones who are in the tribe and the ones who are outside of the tribe, the community. We, we, yes. we help those who are like us, but then we potentially even dislike or unhelp those who are different. That makes us economists, I mean, Akelov and some others have been writing about this, but it makes us very uncomfortable because you know we, we want to think of a world where people are reasonable and they are willing to trade and 
we, we are, we've always been very uncomfortable with that. Um, how, how we have to get used to being uncomfortable. Yes, I'm afraid so. I think, I think that's, and, and a lot of the really important contributions that have come in economics in the last three or four decades have, have been willing to confront uh, our discomfort. <laughs> yes, and, and but in this particular case, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's really making us all, not just economists, but everybody rethink uh, uh, how voting, how societies are, are being organized. Like people seem to often be voting even against their interests because they want to make a statement about their yes. group and the outside group. Yes. How, how do we reconcile these two, these two views of community? How do we make civil society work for the better without, without uh, having this? Uh, I guess this is more of a policy than an analysis question, but it's still yeah, I think one this, that is extremely important. I think. Yeah, this is a question probably for you <laughs> um, in, in, in your role. But, but we, um, uh, uh, as economists, have to, have to have a framework where those questions figure and where our tools and uh, you know, where we're able to in incorporate these aspects of human behavior in into our modeling and our thinking. Uh, otherwise, there really is no way that we can build a coherent new paradigm unless we can take on those issues. So say, say in the COVID, I think the mask question is really a great example of, um, of, of this question of identity. So in some economies where, or some countries, some societies, where there's a social norm to wear a mask whenever you have a cold or a cough because you want to protect others. Okay, you know, we're right down there in the, in the bottom of the triangle. Um, and that's been linked for some... Asian countries, Japan, it's been talked about quite a lot in the last couple of weeks, as playing a, an important role in containing the spread of the virus. But there are other countries where there's a notice on the outside of, of a shop saying, if you're wearing a mask, you can enter. So that's, that's identity. Uh, this identity, totally, it is identity. So, so let's go back then to the economics of all these things. So in, in a way, uh, thinking about com community and civil society, thinking about identity has to make us rethink in this new paradigm you're, you're setting up. Uh, what, uh, I mean, for example, economist Schiller has written something recently, but mm -hmm. economists haven't been thinking about narratives. Uh, traditionally, and in, in principle, the way you frame a question, framing is huge in psychology, in economics shouldn't matter. How we understand it hugely does. Yes. So how does modern economics need to change and accommodate all these ideas that you're, that you're raising? Yeah, so I think modern economics has, has the goods. So, um, and we just need to, uh, we just need to use them. So, 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 so what do I mean by that? I, I, I mean that um, really two, two, elements of modern economics, two of the really big breakthroughs uh, are needed here to create the new economic model that sits above the new values and, and create, could create a new paradigm. It's not there yet, but you know, we, we should all be kind of part of this project. Um, and the two elements are uh, the information economics. So as soon as you except, you know, originally high X point, but then developed much more um, in, in economics in the last few decades. If you take the point that information is limited and local, then it, it must be the case that you cannot solve all problems through contracts. And as soon as you've recognized that, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to use two things, social norms and private power within, say, within organizations. So just like your case thinking about companies. Uh, so you, you can't solve the, the, the problem between the owner and the manager with a contract. You can't solve the problem between the manager and the worker with a contract. So those two elements, which were kind of expunged from economics in the sort of uh, height of the Balrasian version of neoclassical economics, they, can, they have been brought in by information economics and then the other element which touches on um, identity and that we were referring to, which is um, a much richer idea of what people are like. So economists indeed have had to step away from homo economicus 
It's a good model for shopping, but it's not a good model for many of the other problems that we need to analyze. And that's so, where behavioral economics, you know, obviously drawing a lot on psychology has, uh, has also given us many insights that allow us to help construct this, this new model. So uh, I, 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 I think one could call this project you've been engaged in. Many of us have been engaged in little bits of it, but you're taking it very broadly, kind of economics with real humans in it, right? And, and in, in a way, you've, you've, done, you've done a huge amount of, of, of thinking on how to also reconceptualize the teaching of economics also, to have even the most basic undergraduate courses include these new perspectives. I mean, those of we who've been teaching for all our lives have been enduring the frustration of getting an 18 or 19 year old kid and teaching them uh, some calculus uh, that is supposed to explain the world. And, and really all those initial economics courses that, that we were teaching didn't have all this richness of motivations or information, et cetera, that, that, that you're talking about. And, and you have had a lot of impact rethinking teaching to include these considerations from the start, from the very first day the student comes into the classroom. Could you tell us a little bit about this core project and, and, and your experience trying to rethink it and, and, and how? Yeah, sure, it? sure. And maybe just to draw a thread back to where we started uh, talking, um, back to the, the post-World War II and the post-Great Depression. Um, because that's when we had, we, we really had a change in the way economics was taught. And what happened then was, was written down in Samuelson's very famous textbook um, published in 1948. And what he did, he just changed the whole textbook around. So he sent supply and demand to the back of the book. It, it appears in chapter 19 on page 447. And on page 457, he says, well, that's all there is to supply and demand. So he put all of the, the, the stuff to address the problem, the big problem of the Great Depression and the theory that would mean it wouldn't happen again at the front. And that's the same kind of thinking in the core project where we've said, what are the big problems we confront now? Okay, it's not the Great Depression. Um, little did we know there'd be a global pandemic. But, um, and, and what, what we've done, and it's, it's an interesting exercise, I think, for anyone who's, who's in a classroom, is to, with your beginning students, is to ask the question before you've said anything to them, just ask them what they think are the, are the big, most pressing problems that economists should be addressing. And we've got lots of data on that. And, and, and what do they say? They say inequality, climate change, innovation, the future of work, financial instability, unemployment, they're the big topics. And so what, what we've done in the project with you know, lots of researchers have been involved in this project is to say, let's take really big questions, really important questions, not shopping, but really big questions as the subject of economics and teach economic models as ways of gaining insight into these problems. So that's been the kind of, uh, if you like, the sort of um, the way we've worked in the project and how we've been able to draw in a lot of um, recent research into the first course. And that's potentially Samuelson claim going to have a lot of impact. Samuelson claimed that it was Duke didn't need to be uh, the Secretary of the Treasury was enough for him to be writing the textbooks, right? And, and that's yeah, that's right. That's a very famous. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, is, so, so you so, maybe yeah. you maybe accomplish something like that. How how has the project been going? I think that for those of, of our viewers who watch it from Spain, there is now a a, uh, a leg of the project that is going to be or that it's already in Spanish today. So today, if you if you go to the website, today's the first day. Today's the first day with, with, with much more of it. So there's 16 units. So uh, really the most uh, huge amount of the, of the free online textbook is there in Spanish. And there's a lot of excitement um, swirling around. There is a close colleague of, of both of us, uh, Antonio Cabrales, who's been very involved in the project. Uh, I don't know yes. if also in the Spanish bit of it. Uh, yes, he has been involved in that, in that as well, yes. Well. Okay, uh, so that's that's. And so there's a Spanish translation. There's also a French and Italian translations. 
and they're all interactive ebooks that are free online. So anyone can just go and have a look. So we'll, we'll profit to do some sales and marketing. This is free and yes. you can go to this webpage uh, and get all those materials uh, for any teacher who wants new, fresh uh, slides and materials. There's a lot of really, really interesting, uh, interesting materials very much addressing what the students' concerns are today. So uh, very recommended. It's a massive uh, piece of public good that you have undertaken because for the moment it hasn't provided any monetary rewards unlike uh, no, that's the bottom who, of the triangle yes <laughs> unless most people who write textbooks that are then sold for 140 dollars and and and, uh, and a very good living from those textbooks you you have chosen the, indeed the bottom of that of that triangle and and that's to be to be uh, thanked but thanks a lot for a very very good discussion we covered a ton of terrain uh i i think that from from understanding new paradigms to to trying to teach them uh, it's a it's a big contribution, and I thank you for your time and your and your generosity with 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 also the knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much.